A reading from the book of the prophet Jeremiah. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will raise up righteous shoot to David. As king, he shall reign and govern wisely. He shall do what is just and right in the land. In his days, Judah shall be saved. Israel shall dwell in security. This is the name they gave him, the Lord our justice. Therefore, the days will come, says the Lord, when they shall no longer say, as the Lord lives, who brought the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt, but rather, as the Lord lives, who brought the descendants of the house of Israel up from the land of the north. And from all the lands to which I banished them, they shall again live on their own land. Verbunda mini. Justice shall flourish in his time, in fullness of peace forever. O God, with your judgment endow the king, and with your justice the king's son. He shall govern your people with justice, and your afflicted ones with judgment. For he shall rescue the poor when he cries out, and the afflicted when he has no one to help him. He shall have pity for the lowly and the poor. The lives of the poor he shall save. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, who alone does wondrous deeds, and blessed forever be his glorious name. May the whole earth be filled with his glory. This is how the birth of Jesus Christ came about. When his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, but before they lived together, she was found with child through the Holy Spirit. Joseph, her husband, since he was a righteous man, yet unwilling to expose her to shame, decided to divorce her quietly. Such was his intention when, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary, your wife, into your home, for it is through the Holy Spirit <clears throat> that this child has been conceived in her. She will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, 
and they shall name him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. When Joseph awoke, he did as the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took his wife into his home. He had no relations with her till she bore a son, and he named him Jesus. Verbum Domini. Laudator Jesus Christus, praise be Jesus Christ, now and forever. We all know people, and I'm sure some of us even have relatives, who are so concerned with how things look. They want to, as we would say in Italian, make una bella figura. It looks good. It was even a show produced by the BBC called Keeping Up Appearances about this woman who was constantly trying to impress her neighbors that she was of a higher social class than she actually was. A friend of mine had an uncle who was of that genre, as we may say. He was born Salvatore Pasquale. But when he moved into this other neighborhood, he changed his name to Sam Pascal. He thought, Salvatore Pasquale sounds too Italian. So he wanted people to think he was, you know, like the rest of the neighborhood. He was always trying to impress people that he was of better means than he actually was. And my friend told me at one time he went to such lengths to put on this bella figura that when his brother-in-law, who came from New England, was visiting, and he didn't like his brother-in-law, there was always this competition his brother-in-law came from a lot of money, and Sam, or Salvatore, thought, well, he was going to impress him, so he would always rent a luxury car and make it seem as if that was his car. He would go and rent the biggest Cadillac there ever was and act as if that was his personal automobile. He went, went, went to such lengths like that, but one time when he did do that, when you, when you rent the car, you don't know who rented it before you. Somebody who rented it before him had left something behind. And there was a little note saying, I love you, honey. It was signed, Susie. There's nobody in Salvatore's family named Susie. So he had some explaining to do, as Ricky Ricardo would have to say. Now, at first glance, many people think that St. Joseph was concerned with appearances but in a benign sense, he sees, he finds out, Mary's with child, he knows he's not the father, and so he decides to divorce her quietly. He doesn't want to expose her to shame. And many people presume that meant, well, he concluded that somebody else was involved, but he didn't want to expose Mary to dishonor and shame. But I remember one time when Father Fred Miller, who was teaching at the Mount St. Mary Seminary at the time, gave a wonderful homily on the Feast of St. Joseph. And he said that perhaps that's not really St. Joseph's motivation, that he did not presume that Mary had been unfaithful to him, but that he realized this was above his pay grade. Something was happening that was supernatural and that he didn't feel worthy, did not feel worthy to be a part of this, so he decided to divorce her quietly. Not that he had presumed that she had been unfaithful, but that he was not worthy. And that's why the angel said, don't be afraid, Joseph, take Mary as your wife. I think that's the interpretation we should give to this passage. Not that Joseph was embarrassed by Mary, but that he was embarrassed about himself. Lord, I'm not worthy. Domine nom sub dignus. We even say it at the Mass. Like the centurion who says to Jesus, Lord, I'm not worthy that you would come under my roof. We may feel like St. Joseph and say, well, I'm not worthy. 
But it's not your choice to make. God chose you. He chose Joseph. He knows what he's doing. Look who he picked to, to fight Goliath. David. This runt kid. You know? Goliath laughed at him. The Philistines laughed at him. But David slew Goliath. God chose the Hebrew people. In the eyes of the ancient world, the Egyptians were great, powerful. The Babylonians, the Persians. Yet it was the Hebrew people, nomads, he chose. He picked Abraham, a wandering Aramean. God chose you and he chose me. Just as Jesus chose 12 apostles, most of whom were fishermen. These weren't guys who, you know, went on their yachts and went out and got these big marlin fish. These were guys who, you know, had these nets and would get the stinky fish and have to sell them. A tax collector, St. Matthew. This isn't like Today, where people say, oh, I work for h &R Block. Oh, that's very prestigious. No, Matthew was considered a bane of society. He was a collaborator with the Romans. Yet Jesus chose him. So like St. Joseph, we have to heed the words of the angel, do not be afraid. That was the motto of St. John Paul the Great <clears throat> as he began his papacy. Be not afraid. Today there's a lot to be afraid about. Many things in the world are still frightening. We still have terrorism. We still have people who are addicted to nasty drugs. We have people who are addicted to pornography. We have people who are coming from broken families. Or virtually no family at all. We've seen the horrible scandal that has plagued our church. There are many things to be afraid of. And yet, in the midst of all this, we're told, don't be afraid. But look in the ancient world when Jesus came. The Roman Empire was the big kid on the block. They were the power to contend with. And yet, Jesus was born in this little stable... In Bethlehem, Bethlehem, this was out in the woods there, so to speak. This wasn't the big city that Bethlehem is today. This was way out there. Yet Jesus was born in this obscure place in abject poverty, surrounded by animals and shepherds, his loving mother and her husband. Is that what the world was afraid of? What's the world afraid of today? It's afraid of the truth. The truth that there are only two genders, men and women. That marriage is between one man and one woman. That every human being is precious and has value from the first moment of conception to the last breath of old age. These things the world is afraid of. So it denies it. It hides it. It obscures it. Perverts it. Twists it. So people today are afraid to speak the truth. They're afraid to have a sense of humor. They're taking little kitty shows and saying, oh, there's hidden meanings behind that. What we should be afraid of are those powers against life and truth that are against the faith. There's still people out there who hate us because we have faith, because we have a religion. There are some people who want to impose their religion upon everyone. This idea of having a caliphate. That's ISIS and Al-Qaeda. They don't want coexist. They want us off the face of the earth. But society... They sanitize certain things, certain words, certain phrases. Can't say that. But what they can say, ridiculous. 
Next time you go to the doctor's office, look at the forms they give you these days. Not just don't they ask you just your name and your address. They ask you your gender. Used to be male, female. Now there's 16 of them. 16? And then marital status, 25. 25, either you're married or you're single. Maybe you're widowed. But now there's all these other, well, in between. In between? There's people who think they're in between in their genders, and there's people who think they're in between in their marriage. Hello? Two plus two is four. That's it. Is it maybe five? No. Is it maybe three? No. It's four. We have to deal with reality as it is. I had a relative who was into appearances. Always want everyone to think that he had the best scotch in the world. He used to get the empty scotch bottles from a friend of his who had lots of money. So he had these single malt rare scotch bottles and put the cheap stuff in there. So when the people with relatives would come, he'd put it out and make sure you saw the label. Everybody knew it was cheap hooch. But that's the way the world is. They want to put on a false face. And it's more than just this idea of fake news. It's this idea of it's all pretend, it's synthetic, it's artificial. Here we have the real thing. God has revealed to us divine truth in sacred scripture and sacred tradition. God has manifested himself. And not only does, has he spoken the truth, he is the truth. Jesus is the word, the word who became flesh. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So we have nothing to worry about, nothing to be afraid about, if we stay with him. And Jesus was grounded in reality. He called a sin a sin. Adultery is adultery. At the same time, though, he showed mercy to someone who is repentant of being complicit in adultery. The woman caught in adultery was a sinful person, yet she repented. So he doesn't want them to clobber her with rocks. He says, let he who is without sin cast the first stone. Because everybody's always willing to point out the faults of everybody else. As Jesus said so plainly in the, in the scripture, you know, why worry about the splinter in your brother's eye when you got a two by four in your own? Some of us have 84 lumber yard in our eye. It's a whole big enterprise there, or the, a forest. It's easy to point out where other people have made mistakes. But we have to look in the mirror and see who's there. Be merciful to me, a sinner. And in these last few days of Advent, if you haven't done it already, go to confession. Be honest with yourself and with God. That's the best Christmas present you could give to our Lord. And then make sure you put first and foremost that you go to church for Christmas. So many people say, oh, Father, it's so busy in that. It's so busy you forget what the reason of the day is? I had somebody tell me years ago, oh, they couldn't get the Mass on Christmas. And it wasn't because we had three feet of snow. There was no snow. It wasn't because their car broke down. Because they had relatives coming in from out of town. Guess what? Take them with you. You want something to eat today for Christmas? You're going to church with us. Otherwise, you're on your own. Oh, Father, we couldn't do that. Why not? Seems reasonable to me. If they want to eat, they got to work. Worshiping God is a holy work. It's a holy enterprise. We're so worried about appearances. Don't be afraid. Do the right thing. May God bless us and Mary keep us.